Porque... Uau, bem-vinda. Então, a Mari Luiz vai apresentar um caso de advocacy internacional. Ela trabalha no setor da filantropia e com organizações sem fins lucrativos desde 2010. E ela está empenhada em promover mudança social maior e mais acelerada por meio da ativação e mobilização de recursos filantrópicos. Ela está representando The Forward Global, uma comunidade de 400 líderes globais comprometidos em resolver questões sociais mais urgentes do mundo. É a maior comunidade do gênero e envolve líderes que procuram aproveitar o seu tempo, seu talento, seus recursos e seus laços, suas relações para um impacto sustentável. Então, bem-vinda. Obrigada. Olá, Pessil. Olá, bom dia. Um, so I must, like Heather, thank you for your grace and patience that this is in English. I am actually trying to make amends. I have a 162-day streak on Duolingo, which I'm quite proud of. Um, but it turns out that being able to say that your uh, grandmother doesn't like to eat chicken or that your cousin is wearing a red skirt is not that helpful for a presentation on advocacy. So thank you for the patience. So my name is, is Mary Ruth Gawley. I'm the Managing Director uh, for Europe for an organization called Forward Global. We actually relaunched our brand last week, so until last week we were called the Philanthropy Workshop. And we were set up nearly 30 years ago to bring together philanthropists who wanted to have more strategic impact in their work. And we've been doing that work ever since, taking people on what we hope is a very transformative journey, taking very trust-based, collaborative approaches. And as people started to learn alongside one another, we hadn't originally thought about why we would have a community. And so people were coming for education, but what they were saying was that they were leaving with community. And so we started to put a bigger framework around that as we realized that actually the biggest influence that was happening was when funders were talking to other funders and sharing what some of their best practices were. And those best practices often went nowhere. And so we really have been striving to get some of the incredible work, so those best practices, to become common practices. So today we're a community of about 400 philanthropists globally. We try and create a really safe and trusted space for challenging discussions to happen. We're also huge believers in the value of global community. And it's vital that there's cross-pollination of ideas that are happening all over the globe, so that those are transcending boundaries, that we're all able to help one another to accelerate learning, share new ideas, challenge one another to take bigger risks, be more entrepreneurial, be bold and really consider what's the role of philanthropy that other streams of capital simply cannot do. So, it's wonderful that we're all gathered here today because I'm seeing lots of shared similarities um, in terms of what we can achieve when we come together as a sector. So, on to today's presentation. The objective. The objective is to explore why advocacy as an important part of any funder strategy for lasting impact learning from an international case study that we've put together. So a lot of our work at Forward Global is really helping people think about approaches, tools, frameworks that can guide this strategic philanthropy. And every time you use a case study, it's not only about the theme that you're using, it's also about how all of those tools, those approaches are applicable to your work. So, I would also point you to the wonderful report that's in front of you. I think page 79 of the Portuguese version is where advocacy starts. Before we start talking about systems and advocacy, we actually need to talk about impact. So before you think about your impact as a funder, you need to realise that this will fundamentally change the strategy that you take. So there are lots of frameworks, lots of toolkits out there. We prefer to express the choice as, as a very simple story. And it's a story about the baby, and some of you might even know it. So it goes like this. You're going for a lovely walk, perhaps along the river that we can see out of the window here. And you see a baby floating past. So any suggestions of what someone might do if they see a baby floating past in the river? 
Any guesses? What might you do? Baby's voting. You would rescue it, exactly. And then you see, out there in this lovely river, a second baby. What do you do? You rescue it. And then more babies come, and more babies come. And at a certain point, what do you do? What might you do? Thank you. Search for the source. So at some point, you are going to go and look upstream. What is happening further up the river that means the babies are floating past? So it's exactly this choice between pulling the baby out of the river or looking upstream, which represents two types of impact. And we here have called them rescue and lasting change. In reality, of course, it's not that black and white, but for simplicity, we're just representing it in this way to help us think about what are different approaches that we might take. So just going down the columns, the rescue, so that is where you're leaping in and you're saving the baby. Um, what you're doing is pulling the baby out of the river. The success metric is simply the number of babies saved, the higher the better. The complexity is, is simple. You literally go in, pull it out, job done. The time expected to see success is short. And the ease of measuring that success is easy because it's very countable. And the capacity required to solve the problem is lower. You know what you're going to try and do. If we move to the lasting change, that is where you're going upstream and you're trying to prevent the babies from, from being thrown into the river. So the success metric would be fewer babies in the river. And you might not know how you're going to prevent that from happening. So the complexity of the intervention is therefore higher. The time expected to see success is going to be longer. And the ease of measuring success is not simply countable. It's much more difficult to decide how to measure prevention. Um, so the ease of measuring that success is harder and the capacity required to solve the problem is higher. It is more difficult. So it's not to say that one of these is better. Both are needed. It's just that at some point, people do make a, a decision about where they're going to fund. So for us at Forward Global, we've always focused on the lasting change. And that's what the rest of this session is going to look at using the case study. So the case study that I'm going to refer to is that of the Harawa Chihuahua. So we won't have time to go super deep into all of the context, but just a little bit of information. So this is a case study that was kindly shared with us by Freedom Fund. So Freedom Fund is an organization that exists whose sole mission is to help end modern slavery. And they work in the places in the world, the countries, regions, communities, where modern slavery is the most prevalent. Uh, prevalent. And um, I understand they've also just started to work in Brazil. So Harawa Chihuahua, this is the name that is given to a form of bonded labor in the country of Nepal. So Harawa means tiller, so someone that's working the land. And those people would usually be adult males who are doing that work. And Chihuahua means a forced cattle herder. And that would typically be a woman or a child who was doing that work. So these communities, uh, they're impoverished, and they are often forced to take on intergenerational debt, very high interest debt, and it passes on from one generation to the next. So in the meantime, they are working on the lenders of the debt, they're working on their land, trying to repay it. They often cannot keep up with interest payments, and indeed it's not designed for them to, ca to catch up with the interest payments. Um, and they fall into cycles of debt and poverty. They're often threatened with physical abuse, uh, with violence, and they will often take their children out of school in order to have them contribute towards the work in order to try to pay that debt off more quickly. So the communities that are targeted um, are the Dalit communities. So they are seen as the bottom of the hierarchical uh, caste system. And that's a social hierarchy that has existed for many, many years but was formalized and made more rigid by the British government during colonial eras. So the Harawa Chihuahua system is a system of modern slavery. Um, it's a very complex issue, as you'd imagine, but we have seen some steps towards lasting change in recent years. And when talking about lasting change, we refer to a number of things. 
So one is back to the importance of looking upstream. I keep seeing this river up here and I'm now wondering which way it's flowing just in case you know, I never want to go that way or that way. Um, but the problem, when a problem is so deeply rooted, we also need to go back to really thinking about actually how do you change the system? So systems change. So I think before going any further, it's probably worth acknowledging that systems change is probably an overused word and it certainly has uh, feels like it's a little jargony. Um, so we wanted to give a definition, and this is the one that we always refer to. So it's by the wonderful Danella Meadows and her book, Thinking in Systems, which was written quite a number of years ago now. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend doing so. It lays it out in very simple terms, um, and it's fantastic. So the definition is, a system is a set of things. So people, cells, molecules, or whatever, interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behaviour over time. So in the images below, you can see we've got various systems, so biological systems, circulatory, respiratory, we've got an ecosystem in the middle, and then we've got a political system, in this case it's the UN. So those would all be examples of systems. Understanding a system is obviously no mean feat. So we're going to break it down, and the first thing we're going to look at is this set of things. So when we refer to the set of things, quite often what we're referring to are the key stakeholders. And the key stakeholders would be the people who are influencing or are influenced by the change that we are seeking. So we have put together a stakeholder map um, for the Harawa Trawa system. So in the centre, in the yellow, we have the people who are trapped in Harawa Jara. So that would include community groups, the victims of violence, the survivors, um, and the activists. So they are the people who are influenced by the system that they are in. In the red, you have private sector groups, so that includes the employers, uh, the landowners, and we would also have illegal groups in there, so traffickers in this case. The green boxes are civil society, so you can read up there what, what those might be. And in the orange we have the public sector, so including the Nepali government and the international community. So it, it, you can spend a long time mapping stakeholders. Um, so we're just a few messages that I suppose we would emphasise here. It is important to try not to jump to the solution without scoping this wider system. Um, often uh, funders might find that they are disproportionately focused on one area of it. For example, they might focus on the role only of the private sector or only of the public sector. And actually, we see that the best systemic solutions are, of course, when you're considering all of the stakeholders that, fund, that come into the system, working in collaboration with others who are values aligned, but perhaps work in different areas of the system. So this reminds us, back to our definition. So the systems are interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. So for a systemic analysis, we have to understand what those interconnections are. So there are lots of frameworks, again, that can help us do this. We have gone with a very simple one, the iceberg model. So I think everyone's clear on what this does. You can see a little bit at the top, there's lots going on underneath that you can't see. So, the iceberg model of systems. So if you're using the Harawa Trower example, what you would be able to see would be the problems and symptoms. So that might be media coverage in the news, it might be if you visited the community directly, you would see for yourself what was going on. Then you've got the root causes underneath. What's happening below the surface that we don't typically see and that we have to go in and understand what is going on. So those would include behaviours and norms, rules, laws and policies, beliefs and narratives. And all of those would fit under that category, root causes, and that is forces that are defining how the system is connected. And these are all deeply embedded in how we then look at the outcomes that we want to see. And as a general rule, we have to address root causes in order to alter the system and to have that lasting change that we're looking for. So we're now going to bring the, the model of Harawa Trawa into it and see how that maps onto the iceberg. 
So on the surface, we can see the problems of the community. The problems they face are violence and exploitation, debt and bondage, and that lack of education. Beneath the surface, what we can't see is the division of the Harara Chara people. So that is, they lack often the resources to come together and to coordinate with one another. Um, there's a lack of visibility in government. There's no political will. Um, and actually, even though this form of bondage is illegal in Nepal, there's a huge gap between the policy and the implementation. So that's another area that you need to consider. Um, and then we have the discrimination against Dalits in the caste system, which comes back down to deeply embedded uh, cultural norms. So our approach to impact defines where you would then choose to intervene in the system. And there are obviously multiple points where you can come in. So building on this, if we identified more with jumping in and rescuing the baby, you might look at the access to services. So you might be supporting delivery of different services that directly help the communities in Harawa and Chirawa. It's very, very, very important, and it will make a big difference to those people that you help. It won't tackle the root causes. So below the surface, we can see some of the interventions that Freedom Fund started to support. And again, they were designed to tackle the root causes. So they supported the forming, funding, and training of the Harawa and Chirawa network. Um, they really helped the community to build power, to come together, and to coalesce around the changes that they wanted to see. They helped build a dialogue uh, with government to ensure that the people affected were being heard by policymakers. They supported um, jobs training, and they helped communities to find alternative livelihoods. And finally, they supported storytelling and journalism in order to raise awareness across the general public that this abuse was taking place. And I think really importantly to say at this point is that all of these voices were the Harawa Chara people themselves. So it wasn't Freedom Fund's role to try and directly solve the problem themselves, but to raise the voices of the community on the front lines. So what does this have to do with advocacy? Advocacy, there we go. It, the word literally means raising of voices, and it's one that we'll all be very familiar with. So as a noun, an advocate is, would be someone who represents another person's interest. So like a lawyer would do. In fact, the word does actually come from the courtroom. It's from the Latin advocare, which means to add a voice. So to advocate is to add a voice of support to a person or a cause. So literally, add, prefix, to raise or bring together, advocacy, voices. Um, and we like to remind people of this route because there is, a bit like with lots of the jargony words that exist in the sector, there's a very wide range of understanding of what advocacy can mean, and often it's interpreted in a very narrow way, so people think about it like, I don't know, politicians being lobbied behind closed doors would be one example. And that often can make funders feel very uncomfortable. It's something that people will typically sort of say, oh, do you know what, that's not for me. Um, so we use advocacy as an umbrella term um, to encompass all the types of interventions that can help raise the voices of communities. Um, so yes, I've written the key point is this, many of these types of interventions are crucial to addressing root causes and supporting lasting change. I think I've said that about five times already, but it's clearly a key point to what we're talking about. What is that lasting change and how can we come together uh, to get there? So we put together an advocacy framework, and apologies, it's probably quite difficult to read, but very happy to share any of this afterwards. Um, what we've done is plot two different kinds of, um, it's plot all of the different kinds, sorry, not just two, plots more than two. Um, all the kinds of advocacy interventions against two axes. So the X axis shows proximity to power, from the general public on the left to the decision makers on the right. And the y-axis shows the directness of the change. So from building awareness at the bottom to pushing for action at the top. So you'll find all sorts of interventions. So to pull out some examples, bottom left, you've got public education. Uh, bottom right, you've got the research and education of policymakers. You've got community mobilization and movement building on the top left. And you've got lobbying and strategic left litigation on the top right. So again, all of these are different examples. It's very easy, I think, to look at a framework like this and feel overwhelmed. 
Um, it's also very easy to approach this, and in fact anything in philanthropy with a, a scarcity mindset. Um, a lot of people think they don't have the resources, um, even if they work together to, to tackle this. And I think that is an attitude that we also need to be working towards uh, deconstructing. So there are immense resources that can go into this, and people also need to think about what is it that, that they're bringing. So is that financial capital, is it intellectual capital, is it human capital? So the point is here that whilst it can feel overwhelming, you're never on your own when you're trying to do advocacy. So you need to find your contribution. So if you're thinking about what you might do, you might consider what your motivation is. What is it that drives you in this work? You have to feel deeply passionate in order to get change. You need to think about your risk appetite and framework. Are you comfortable taking big, bold risks? We would encourage people to do that. You can think about what you contribute. So we always talk about time, talent, treasure, and ties. So with time, it's pretty obvious. Talent is what are the skills and expertise that you bring? Treasure is the financial resource. And the ties might be coming back to that idea of creating a space or funding people to convene, but also bringing together your networks. You also need to think about going back to the system. Might there be other people who are better placed to intervene, either by proximity, by solutions? And how do you bring those people in to collaborate? And then on top of that, who can support you on your journey? So coming back to the case study, we wanted to close with the, the story of the Haratara and what actually happened when the Freedom Fund did all of those interventions. So they supported a number of interventions across the advocacy framework in sort of all of the different boxes as it were. And they worked with a number of other partners. So first came some examples of some brilliant intermediate outcomes. So that would be more stories in the media, generating awareness, there was a little bit more engagement from the government, and there was a sense that perhaps the political will was increasing. But then there came a real indicator of impact. And in July last year, the government declared the liberation of the Harawa Chua and the establishment of a task force to gather first-hand evidence of abuse and to protect the human rights of the Dalit communities. So after that declaration, the ministry organized a series of closed on consultations, including survivor leaders. They brought in other organizations like the International Labor Organization, um, the Sports Freedom Fund, and they brought in a series um, of different partners to advise on the rehabilitation guidelines for the Harawa Chua. And those guidelines included everything from debt cancellations to new land uh, entitlements, new housing entitlements. And the government also increased the budget to protect the Harawa Chua. So those successes took pretty much a decade for Freedom Fund to, to achieve. Um, and of course, the story isn't closed yet. Um, there are lots of systemic changes that are still going on. And again, you've still sometimes got this gap between policy and implementation. And you need to have accountability uh, in, in, within the system to ensure that those changes are, are still happening. So Freedom Fund, in partnering with survivors and those at risk of slavery, so going back to the stakeholder map, as well as visionary investors, governments, other anti-slavery organisations have been really collaborative. They brought together all of the knowledge, all of the capital and the will needed to dismantle the system that had allowed slavery to exist and indeed thrive in these areas. So looking ahead, what might this mean for someone within their philanthropy? So what would systemic change look like for the problem you seek to address? And how might advocacy help you get there? So there's a few things, again, just building on top of what we've said. So really reiterating, what are the things that you, in your work, might consider? So community organizing and movement building. Campaigns, campaigning, narrative change. Strategic litigation is absolutely a part. Coalition building, research, policy change. Funding some of those things that don't always feel like they have direct impact and can take a while to come through. Shareholder activism is increasingly important and increasingly being used as a tool, and funder activism and donor mobilization um, as well. So we're always keeping in mind how can you be collaborative and how can you be long-term? Certainly comments that have, that have already come up because they're some of the most critical things that we can do when we are out there trying to do this work. So keeping in mind, so, We've put a few things here that we think are important, and again, it's building on a lot that we've heard from, from Heather and from our other speakers this morning. 
So we would encourage taking a trust-based approach. Listen to the people that you're working with. We would encourage people to seed power, to understand the dynamics that exist and think, actually, at the end of the day, we're all trying to strive for the same things. We all have that impact in mind. So what's the role and how do we understand the role that we can play and also the role that we can't play? Obvious one, be as collaborative as possible. Take a long-term and patient approach. Certainly fund multi-year and fund unrestricted. Allow that space for opportunity, creativity, and voices to step in and come forward. You do need to clearly map the system. Don't spend too long on it, though. You need to also move to action. Figure out what those levers are that you need to push. Also identify the gaps in the system. It's very easy for there to be duplication. Where are the places that nothing is happening, where no one is working? Can you plug those gaps? The barriers and how to overcome those can be difficult sometimes because they're not always easy to see. So think about the iceberg model. What are the things that are going on that could prevent change, even if you've got everything else in place? And remember as well that systems themselves are permeable and interconnected. So that's a whole other sort of added layer to once you've got that system, you still need to remember that the system sits within other systems, and they are interconnected, and they are influenced in so many different ways. So what is the capital that you can deploy? You can think of that as the, your financial, your human, your intellectual capital, or going back to the idea of time, talent, treasure, ties, there are far more ways in one uh, that, that you can bring to help achieve that change. And then we would also just advocate for an abundance mindset. We're all here because we believe in the potential of this work. And if we are able to come together, if we are able to realize that we do have the resources, we do have the potential, we do have the knowledge, we are able to achieve those changes. So, to finish, advocacy is quite simply it's about raising an awareness about a topic or an issue. And it's about encouraging leaders or the government, government officials, to make changes to legislation or policy in support of the issue. And without advocacy, many of the voices that need to be elevated would remain silenced. And it would be much more difficult to achieve systems change through tackling root causes. So I would encourage you all to use your voices to empower the voices of others to be heard and I'd also encourage you to read the report because there's some fantastic pointers in there for how to be and do more advocacy in your work. Thank you very much and thank you for having me.